to deliver a lecture on history of mathematics in Islamic civilization. Uh, I guess he amended a little bit the title with some examples because probably he doesn't want to cover everything in detail. It should be a course on its own if he covers everything. Uh, He's from the University of uh, Utrecht University in Netherlands, Department of uh, Mathematics. Uh, between, before I give the floor to Professor Jan, if you type uh, Professor Jan's name, full name in Google, he has his own website where you can find all his translation, his, his works that either published works in PDF format or his work that he has published the names. He has translated a number of works from Arabic into uh, European languages. Full details you have in his website. Am I right, uh, Professor Jan? Yes, you are right. Yes, the floor is yours. Uh, if you don't mind for our, uh, uh, as I said earlier, you know that uh, in this session, we, in this, um, Winter school, we added mathematics uh, as an extra curricula. Uh, so uh, I tried to introduce shortly, but uh, I would love you to introduce yourself further, you know. Uh, the floor is yours, Professor Jan. Okay, thank you very much. So can you all hear me? I just uh, want online, to check. It. Are they hearing well online? Okay, very good. Uh, well. Thank you very much for inviting me to speak at this winter graduate school. Um, I will uh, first pre give a presentation which will not last too long because after that I uh, will give you a small workshop. But one of the things which I always like very much is to have interaction with the uh, audience. And uh, so we will have a workshop and after that there will be a second presentation in this way, I try to uh, keep the talk a little bit lively because I realize that it is late in the afternoon for you, so you may be tired. Uh, is that correct? Are you tired? Yes. Are you... yes, yes, yes. Okay, very good. So, uh, so I uh, apologize for the fact that I could not be with you because I have other commitments already when I received the invitation. Um, in this presentation, there may be some information for you which you want to keep. It is not necessary to take notes because you can download the presentation from my website. The address is there and I will also show the address at the end. So you can just relax and look at the presentation and if there is anything you want to uh, keep, then just download it. Now let's see if I can uh, get the next uh, page. Yeah. So uh, no, this is not what I wanted. I just have to, because this this the screen sharing is a bit. Okay, here we are. This is the uh, introduction to my talk. I want to begin by saying something about the internet and what the internet has done for our field. And I mean Islamic science, not Islamic mathematics, because it is not really possible to separate mathematics from astronomy, nor from the other sides, but especially mathematics and astronomy is really a unit in the Islamic tradition, because most of the mathematicians studied mathematics in order to become astronomers or to study astronomy. So first I will say something about the internet, then a little bit about scientific problems inspired by Islamic law. This has already been addressed by the other speakers. Uh, for example, Professor Fernini, you have heard his lectures. Then we will have a brief interactive workshop on reading old manuscripts. And then I will present some examples to you in an interactive way. So this is what uh, we will going we will be uh, doing. Our first question is what are the sources for our knowledge of science and technology between 800 and 1600 in the Islamic world? I mean uh, common era not Hijra era. 
So basically we have three uh, categories of sources. There are manuscripts in Arabic, in Persian, and in Ottoman Turkish. The big libraries are in Istanbul, in Turkey, in Tehran, in Iran, in Cairo, in Egypt. And also we have a very big library in Leiden, in the Netherlands. This is how I started to study science in Islamic civilization. Because you may ask, why does a person from the Netherlands who is not a Muslim uh, get interested in the subject? And the answer is, I was trained as a mathematician, but started to study Arabic just for fun, because I was interested. And then my teacher, she showed me this incredible library that we have in Leiden, which has many manuscripts that have never been looked at. And so when I was a young student, age 20 or 21, I was looking at manuscripts that had not been read for eight centuries. And these manuscripts contained very interesting mathematics. So this is how I got interested in the subject. Then secondly, we have old instruments. The photo shows an instrument called Astrolabe. It was made in the city of Lahore in Pakistan in the 16th century. Third, there are old buildings. What you see is the uh, Madrasa of uh, Ulu Bay in Samarkand, which has beautiful geometrical decorations, which also require some knowledge of mathematics. So um, maybe you have never asked yourself, but if you ask yourself, how can I get information about Arabic manuscripts? If I have an author, for example, for example, Ibn al-Haytham, and I want to see what Arabic manuscripts there are, what do I do? Well, the answer is, you go to the works of Professor Seskin, uh, 1924 to 2018, so he died rather recently. He published long lists of Arabic manuscripts arranged according to subject. Here you see his photo against the background of the books that he published. There is a volume on mathematics, a volume on astronomy. This is the volume on astronomy, a volume on astrology. Who is, he was doing all, everything there is. And in each volume, you find a list of author. And for every author, you find the manuscripts in many libraries in the world. It was really Professor Seskin's life work to compile these lists in his institute together with some collaborators. So the question is how to find, not, not only how to find manuscripts, but also how to find books and articles by modern researchers on science in Islamic civilization. For example, if I want to know something about mathematics uh, in a certain period or from a certain author. So what you do is you go to the big bibliographies, most important, of course, Poet Seskin's uh, books. The titles are History of Arabic Literature, Volume 5, Mathematics until 1030, published in 1974. Volume 6, Astronomy until 1030, published in 1978, and so on. Actually, the titles are in German, but I have put the English equivalents here. And you don't have to know German. You can just read mm -hmm. the information. It's, Ibn al-Haytham is, of course, Ibn al-Haytham in German. So you don't really need to know that language. More recently, there is the work by Maris Abramovich Rosenfeld and Ekmeledin Ihsanoglu, a Russian and a Turkish scholar called Mathematicians, Astronomers, and Other Scholars of Islamic Civilization and Their Works from 7th to 19th centuries, uh, published in Istanbul, 2003. Fuad only goes through 1030 and Rosenfeld and Ixanoglu until the 19th century. So it has uh, also information about the later periods. To the right, you see a picture of Professor Seskin and my PhD student, Hussein Shen, who is now in Qatar. 
Germany is close to the Netherlands. And Fuad Seskin was living in Germany, uh, only four hours away from my uh, village where I'm li living by train. So I used to visit him every three or four months. And one of the things he did was to make all the literature available to scholars. So he reprinted many books and articles on Islamic mathematics and astronomy, which are very hard, hard to find. But he reprinted them in these blue volumes. So you see Hussein and Professor Seskin against the background of the 120 blue volumes full of editions of Arabic texts, uh, translations, uh, commentaries, studies on Islamic mathematics and astronomy. So this is very valuable. But now, if you do not uh, have these books, then these days you can go to the internet. And the internet offers new possibilities and it has really changed the field. And very soon we will see an example of this. So I have listed some websites which offer books and articles on history of Islamic mathematics and astronomy and much else, and especially for the older literature. So if you have never seen these websites, you may want to visit them. I have used them a lot to find books and articles. So I'll go through them briefly. There is archive.org based in USA, has many books and articles. My friends in Pakistan also uploaded many books and articles on Islamic science on this website. Then jstor.org, also an American site. They have many articles in journals and often there are copyright issues. But for you, it is possible to have a free account and to read a limited number of articles on uh, this website, maybe you can read 100 articles a month, but you, can, will, you will never be able to read as much. Then there is website gallica.bnf.fr, which also literature in French. There is a lot of old literature in French. The Qatar Digital Library, www.qdlqa, has a lot of literature also. Then there is Astro slash cabinet.ru, uh, many books and articles on history of astronomy and Russian. When I visited Professor Seskin as a young student, he told me that I should learn Russian. So I did. I learned Russian at least for reading because there were many important articles in Russian and also Arabic books that had been translated into Russian with commentary. So very important uh, to consult that literature. Then there is a site in Austria, which has a lot of German literature. And then also uh, this uh, website, Menadoc, with the complicated uh, address, which has a lot of literature in German. So from this, you can find a lot. And then there are three more websites that should be mentioned. Uh, first, David King is a very important author, also for our talk today. He is very much uh, aware with the internet and he has put all his works online. So he is now, I think, almost 80 years old, has written a lot of books of articles and they can all be accessed via the website academia.edu. You can make a free account. Then there is Dr. Shirida Mullah Sharma. Uh, to the right, you see a picture from his website. He has written a catalog of Indian astronomical instruments, which has more than 4,000 pages. And maybe you think, because this is Indian astronomical instrument, it has nothing to do with Islamic science. But that is not true, because uh, 1,500 pages of these, this book are about astrolabes from Lahore and other scientific instruments from Lahore. And to the right, you see a picture of one of these uh, instruments of a part of an astrolabe. And you see there is some very interesting metal work here. There is calligraphy also on here. It's usually, it's really an amazing work. So this can be downloaded free of charge from his website, www.srsharma.in. So the website is based in India. He lives in Germany, but website is in India. 
Then there is uh, Ptolemy of Alexandria, a Greek astronomer, but his work was translated into Arabic. His most important work is uh, called Almagest. Already this is an Arabic word. And they have uh, a project in Germany and a website which has the Almagest in Arabic and also the commentaries, for example, by Nasir al This is also worth visiting because it has a lot of material. So now you are probably uh, very interested, but uh, also a little bit confused because these, there are so many websites, so how can I find the information I want? Well, I cannot really uh, help that because I'm now going to add to the confusion. Uh, I, I will, I will uh, help you out, but now I, I will make it even more confusing because some libraries are now putting original unpublished Arabic manuscripts online. And that means that you can start doing your own research. In the old days, you had to go to these libraries and ask for a microfilm, wait for a long time, write a letter why you want to have this microfilm. Maybe you would not get it, or you would have to go there and would need an introduction because they would not admit you and they would not give the manuscript to you and you would have to, to have a lot of arguments. It would take a lot of your nerve and time. But this has now finished because they are putting many things online. Especially the libraries in Berlin, in Paris and London, London in cooperation with Qatar. They have put many Arabic manuscripts online. And we will see some of these manuscripts later today. An example is what you see here, a table for finding the Qibla, which is the most uh, accurate table that was produced in the medieval Islamic tradition. And it's now online. So you can just download it on your laptop. And maybe you see uh, Arabic and you think you cannot read it. At the end of this uh, uh, session, you will be able to read this Arabic. Also people who do not know Arabic. Maybe you don't believe it, but then you just have to wait and we will see. Okay, <clears throat> so how can you find these manuscripts? Well, there are uh, some websites. These websites have already been mentioned. The Galica website in France has the manuscripts in Paris. The Qatar Digital Library has the manuscripts in London. Then this website has the manuscripts in Germany. There is this website which has some of the manuscripts in Leiden. There is an international initiative, Islamic Scientific Manuscripts Initiative. It's based in Berlin. It has this website and you can find a lot of information. But I'm sure I have added to the confusion now because with all this sea, this ocean of information, how can you find out what's there if you are in interested in a particular subject? It's getting more and more difficult. Sometimes it seems like that. Well, I discussed this uh, problem with Professor Seskin uh, a long time ago, and we decided that it would be nice to have some websites uh, devoted to specific uh, Islamic authors. And so I started to make these websites. I started with a website devoted to Abu Raihan Biruni, www.albiruni.nl. And then after that, I made a website on Kharizmi. The reason was I was invited by Kharizmi University in Tehran, Iran, in order to celebrate the 100th anniversary of their university. So I made this website for them as a present. And then there is www.ibnalhaitham.nl on the works of Ibn al-Haytham. I didn't really want to make that, but I was working on preparing Sabra's translation of books four and five of Kitab al Manather of optics for the press. And so I had collected so much information that I thought I will put it on a website. So these websites have the same structure of Professor Fuad Seskin's works, and he has always supported them. He told me anything I have in my institute you can scan and you can put on these websites. Uh, I, and I told him, your institute should really do it. And he said, no, 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 we have no time for it. So you can start doing it. Of course, I am not an institute. So what I can do is only limited. I will have these three websites, but not more. 
that maybe some other institutes will make uh, a more uh, complete survey. But what can you do on these with these websites? Well, an example is, uh, you remember Dr. Nadir's uh, talk last week, where he showed you this uh, very intriguing uh, picture of the human eye. I'm sorry, the uh, uh, quality of the picture is not very high, but you probably remember it from his talk. Now, just like me, you were probably intrigued by this picture. And suppose you want to know what Ibn al-Haytham wrote about it. Then you can go to the website, www.ibnalhaytham.nl, where all his works are listed. And for every work you have the manuscripts, the edition in Arabic, the translation, and so on. So you go and look at the first work, which is Kitab al-Manazir, which is in seven books, Maqalat in Arabic. So you can, on the website, you can download the Arabic edition of books one to three by Abdul Hamid Sabra. The picture is on page 136, so this picture. Or you can download the English translation of books one to three by Sabra, where you will find the picture on page 63. So really the internet uh, has made our whole field uh, more democratic in the sense that a lot of information is available not only to scholars, but also to students. I mean, or, or even people who have no uh, previous knowledge of Islamic science, they can just go to these websites or go to the websites of all these libraries and download the stuff. It is available for everybody. Okay, now uh, about uh, today's talk. My original idea was, so I will explain you the original idea of my talk and then how it was destroyed. So first, uh, the original idea was to take uh, some aspects of the scientific relations, tradition in Islamic civilization related to Islamic law, and especially mathematics, of course. For example, finding direction of Mecca, Qibla, prayer times, Islamic calendar, inheritance problems, or geometric decorations. To the right, you see a photo of geometric decorations, which are really everywhere all over the Islamic world. This was, picture was taken from Lahore in Pakistan, an old building uh, that uh, I have visited there. So my idea was to take uh, one aspect and then uh, explain it to you. Um, so my plan was to present to you the most famous table from the old Islamic tradition for finding Qibla. And then uh, with a workshop, so you can start reading this table yourself in the manuscript. The most famous uh, Qibla table was the Qibla table computed by Shams Adin al Khalili. Uh, this was a muwakkit and also some at some point a muezzin of the Umayyad Mosque in Damascus in Syria. The Umayyad Mosque has already been mentioned by Professor Fernini in his talk. He has shown you uh, some of the work of Ibn Shatir. Shams Adin al Khalili was living there at around the same time. I see a spelling mistake. I will correct that uh, later. You have to forgive me for it. So the Qibla table by Shams Adin Khalili was published by Professor David King in 1975 from two Arabic manuscripts in Berlin and Paris. And you see to the left, you see his, his article, and you can see this was not even computer time, it was typewriter time, because everything here was written by typewriter. And to the right, you see the page of the Paris manuscript. The manuscripts have been online since around 2010. So at the time when Professor King was writing his article, the manuscripts uh, were not yet online. But now the manuscripts are online, so you can try and find this table in the original manuscript and see what it looked like. So this, I thought, this is a good subject because you don't have to know mathematics in order to understand it, or you have to be able to read numbers. And at the same time, I can give you an 
impression of the richness of this uh, field. So that was my plan to do that. So what I did was I downloaded the Paris manuscript from the internet and then I found something even more interesting. And this was in the end of December 2022, so two or three weeks ago, when I was preparing this talk. And so I really had to decide what to do. Because what I found was in the manuscript also prayer tables for Damascus, which were also computed by Al Khalili, the same person. So you see on the top of this manuscript, Amal Mawak. Mawakit Anahar, Walail, Liar Dimashk, and on the number. So it's really for timekeeping in uh, during the day and the night for the latitude of Damascus. So there was a lot of information that he, this Al Khalidi, computed for prayer tables, tables, prayer times. And that is mathematically even more challenging. So these tables had been mentioned by David King, but they had never been published. The Kibla table had been published, but the prayer tables had not been published. So here I found a treasure which had never been published. And this happens all the time. It happened to me, but it could also happen to you. I mean, if you download a manuscript, you may find something that has never been looked at. Not really. So this makes the history of science in Islamic civilization so rewarding field of research. So what I will try to do now is to present both the Qibla table and the prayer table to you and skip some of the other parts of my talk. And, uh, but uh, now you probably are a bit tired uh, of my talking. And the theme of this graduate winter school is scientific tradition in Islamic civilization. So the word tradition is there, which is very important. So, uh, this is supposed to be out, uh, about the tradition, so therefore I think you have to learn the scientific notations that were used in the tradition by the scientists to write numbers. And so usually this is not the Hindu Arabic system, because you think all oh, the numbers, they are the same as the numbers that we use, they are Hindu Arabic, but that is not true. The scientists and especially the astronomers mostly use the abjad system. So we are now going to read to learn that. Then what about the Hindu Arabic system? Was this never used? Yes, it was used, but only very rarely by Islamic astronomers, only for very large numbers. Here you have an example from Takiuddin Ibn Maruf, uh, who lived in Istanbul around 1570. This is what Hussein Chen is studying for mathematicians. This is a table of tangent. So it's tangent near 90 degrees. And here you have the number 90 and then it says infinity. This is infinity. So here you have uh, 98, uh, 89 degrees, 50 minutes, so a very big tangent. So you have a very large uh, number here. But that was the only point where they used the Hindu Arabic numbers. But then for the fractions, they also used abjad. So we really need the abjad in all cases. And maybe your reaction is now, I can't do it. Now, there are different ways. You can say, I can't do it because I am tired or lazy. And this is something I will not accept. Because look at these people, at these, uh, at your, I'm talking to you as Muslims, your ancestors who were doing mathematics and astronomy. They were never tired or lazy. I mean, they, they really worked very, very extremely hard. And maybe you think, I cannot do this because if you are uh, not familiar with the Arabic uh, language, how am I ever going to read the Arabic alphabet? I mean, this is what I always thought, also thought when I started. But it is, it is not uh, necessary to have these ideas. Because we have my, my team, my team, this, I said my team, it should be my team, my T-E-A-M. My team has developed a workshop for reading abjad numbers, which takes only 20 minutes. Also for people who do not read Arabic. For example, here, this is one of my team members. And here we were, were in Lefkosha in Northern Cy Cyprus in exactly one year ago. And so there were people whose native language is Turkish and who do not know the Arabic alphabet. And they were 
doing the abstract workshop here. And here you have at my home university, Utrecht University, where we had this workshop for students and their parents. In the first year students, uh, after one year, they always invite their parents to come to the university for one day. And so the professors have to uh, have small presentations for them, which take uh, 30 or 45 minutes. So we had the abjad workshop and you see this uh, student and her mother are uh, doing the abjad. So, and here is the other team member who was giving instructions. We had just went to Pakistan, so he's in Shalwat Kamis, as you see. So this is, uh, was also very nice. So we will uh, now uh, begin the workshop. You will need a print of the handout, part one. Um, I hope this has been uh, printed and distributed to the audience. And if you don't have the handout, you can download it at this address. So a very simple address, www j-p-h-o-g-e-n-d-i-j-k this is my name my two initials j-p and then my name h-o-g-e-n-d-i-j-k dot n-l slash h dot pdf so h means for handout or if that's not possible you can also wait and follow the workshop online perhaps now uh, it's also a moment where we can pause for uh, two minutes and maybe if there is one person who wants to ask a question uh, we can do that while I am preparing the screen for the workshop. Is there anybody who wants to ask a question? Can you speak to me? Can, I, can anybody speak to me so I can hear if someone, if, if I can hear you? I don't hear anything. Yes, Professor, we are hearing you. Okay, okay, thank you very much. So I can uh, continue. If any, does anybody have uh, a quality? Yes, we course? distributed all the uh, first. Okay, ex excellent. So there is a question which I can answer. How can we, Yasemin asks, how can we know about the true validity of the source online? Uh, well, essentially to check the validity, you would have to go to the library and check the manuscript but uh, to see whether the manuscript is uh, in agreement with the photo. But I have uh, done this several times and there is, uh, I have never found any mistake. And also the uh, libraries do not have any uh, intention to make uh, mistakes. They really want to present what they have because they are usually very proud to have these manuscripts. So it is a, 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 um, a sign of their pride that they, want to show the manuscript uh, exactly as they have it. Of course, um, sometimes if, um, if the manuscript is in colors, the uh, uh, online version will be black and white. I mean, there is one example that we see later, which is uh, where we have the, only the black and white reproduction. And that is basically uh, a question of limited resources because libraries which have a very large amount of manuscripts cannot put everything online at once. So sometimes what they start doing is taking the microfilms, which they already have, and putting them online, because that is, uh, is easier for them than making new high quality photographs of the manuscript. But also, uh, I know that in the Netherlands, in Leiden, the resources are very limited, so they can put online maybe only a few manuscripts every year. So, but, but I have never uh, seen any, anyone trying to misrepresent uh, a manuscript online. So now we will start uh, the workshop. Um, you have a handout, which uh, looks like this. Do you see my screen? Yes, professor. What you should see is, uh, Something uh, which is called Handout for the Winter Graduate School, Sharjah, January 9, 2023, part one, the abject number system. Correct. I know that uh, there are people who know Arabic and there are people who do not know Arabic. So for the students and staff members who know Arabic, 
this workshop may be interesting for a, re for a special reason. If uh, you want to teach anything about Arabic to non-Arabs who, who are not familiar with it, this is a very good way. So it, and that destroys prejudices because uh, people usually think Arabic is so difficult, I'm not, never going to learn it. But you can show to them that it is, uh, in some respects, it is easy. So first, uh, so this is for uh, non-Arabs, but the Arabs can also look. The principle of the abjad numerals uh, we first present in the Latin alphabet, it's European alphabet, as follows. We give the letters of the alphabet a numerical value as follows. A is one, B is two, G is, J is three, D is four, H is five, W is six, Z is seven, capital H is eight, T is nine. You ask, why this strange order of letters? Well, that's because later application. Here we go on. I is 10, K is 20, L is 30, M is 40, N is 50, S is 60, E is 70, F is 80, C is 90, Q is 100, R is 200, X is 300. And uh, this did not exist in history. It is just uh, our way to make this uh, very easy. Now, how, we, how do we write 11 in abjad? 11 is 10 plus one. So we first write the letter for 10 and then the letter for one. So we write IA, not AI, but first the letter for 10, then the letter for one. 123, three will be 100 plus 20 plus three. So we take the sign for 100 is Q, then the sign for 20, which is K, and the sign for three, which is J. So it's Q, K, J, and not J, K, Q, and not K, G, Q, etc. So Q, K, J. There is no letter corresponding to zero. So if we have 202, we take the sign for 200, that's R, and then the sign for two, that's B. So that is the principle. So now you can take a few minutes to do these exercises, translate the abject numbers, NW, LD, FA, XMA, H, XIT, Q, capital H, R, C, and E. And exercise two is write an abject 24, 258, 307, and 130. So I give you a few minutes for these exercises. Did you finish or do you need more time? Let someone answer, please. Uh, finished. Okay, so we will check the answers now. So here are the uh, answers for NW, LD. So this is funny, this is an L, right? Because otherwise you're confused with one. FA, so NW is 56, LD is 34, FA 81, XMH 345. XIT 319, QH 108, RC 290, and E is 70. And then exercise two, write and abject these numbers. So you get the answer here. By the way, this, these handouts and also the handouts with the solutions are online because what I really hope is 
if you get excited about these workshops, you are going to teach them yourself. We do not uh, have the copyright on anything. Uh, we just want to share as much as we can, and we want you to accept and uh, do with it whatever you like. Okay, now the Arabic alphabet. So the uh, same principle was used for Arabic letters. Now we note that every Arabic letter has at most four shapes. One shape when it's isolated and three shapes in the beginning, the middle and the end of a word. So now we do the same principle for the Arabic letters. We put one is Alif, two is Ba, three is Chim, four is Dal, five is Ha, six is Wow, seven is Zai, eight is Ha, uh, nine is Ta, 10 is Ya, 20 Kaf, 30 Lam, 40 Mim, 50 Nun, 60 is Sin, 70 is Ain, 80 is Fa, 90 is Sat, 100 Kaf, 200 Ra, 300 Shin, and we can even continue, 400 Ta and 500 Ta, etc. Then the system is usually called Abjad, because the word Abjad is a way to remember one, two, three, four. That's Alif, Ba, Jim, Dal, Abjad. So if you say Abjad, you already have one, two, three, four. Well, this of course is uh, not very useful if you want to learn manuscripts. So therefore uh, we have this table here for the numbers one to 91 in Abjad. And so here you see the, uh, the shapes of the letters. So it works like this. You have one here, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, then 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90. And if you want to have 35, you go to the column for 30 and the row for five, and you find this sign here. And so this is 35. Now, if you are Arab, then you will notice that this doesn't look right uh, because uh, normally uh, Arabic letters have dots. For example, the ba has a dot, but in abjad often it doesn't have a dot. Also, jim doesn't have a dot. Zai doesn't have a dot. And ya doesn't have a dot. So it looks very strange. The reason for that is that often uh, the scientists had to write so many numbers. For example, in the manuscript, 150 pages, on every page, 300 numbers. That they wanted to uh, deal with the numbers in a very efficient way. So do not, uh, they did not want to write dots if it's not absolutely necessary. Okay, so now we have some exercises to familiarize ourselves with uh, this uh, uh, number, you these numbers. You remember that the letters have shapes when they are isolated and also in the beginning, in the middle of the end of the world. And so in this table on this page, you can locate the shapes of the letters when they are isolated. One is Aleph, two is Ba, three is Chim, four is Dal, five is Ha. So really this is something to familiarize people with the Arabic alphabet. So where is the, uh, I will do one exercise for you. Where is the uh, one is Aleph? It's here. Right, so you, here you have the isolated form of Aleph. Where is the isolated form of Ba? Where is the isolated form of Jim? Where is the isolated form of Dal? You find this in the table. And then also for 10, for Ya, Kaf, Lam, Mim, Nun, Sin, Ein, Fa, and Sat. Go ahead. So this I will do very quickly because uh, I assume that most of you are familiar with the Arabic. Here we have uh, the isolated shapes of Alif, Ba, Jim, Dal, He, Wow, Zain, Ha, and Ta. And then 10 to 90 are here. Ya, Kaf, Lam, Mim, Nun, Sin, Ain, Fa, and Saat. So the, the isolated forms of the letters are really something that you, you have to accept that they are like this. But now exercise four, look at the numbers 11 and 12 in the table. So you find, you have to find 11 and 12. Now, according to Abjad, 11 is IA. So you have the letter Ya plus the letter Alif. 12 is IB. So you have the letter Ya followed by the letter B. So the question is, 
what are the beginning shapes of Ya and what are the end shapes of Alif and Ba? Because this must be beginning shape of Ya plus end shape of Alif. And this must be beginning shape of Ya plus end shape of Ba. And then the same question for the other numbers. What are the initial forms of Kaf, Lam, Mim, Nun, Sin, Ein, Fa, Saat? And what are the final shapes of Jim, Dal, Ha, Wow, Zai, Ha, Ta? I'll just do the exercise four quickly. So the beginning shape of Ya must be something like this. Again, there are no dots, so this means 10. The end shape of Alif must be that. So you have beginning shape of Ya followed by end shape of Alif here, so that's 11. And the end shape of Ba must look something like this. So we have beginning shape of Ya here, end shape of Ba there. It may not be completely correct but that is due to my computer program. I cannot write uh, everything I want in Arabic, but at least this should be clear. So I'll let you look a little bit longer about the other numbers. Of course, I apologize to the uh, Arabic people because they know this already. But if there are people from, from other countries, Turkey, for example, then they do not know this, so they will not be able to read manuscripts. So just the answers are here. Here are the initial forms, 20 calf, 30 lim, lamb, 40 meme. So you see the initial form, the tail disappears and there is only this little circle that remains. Also noon, the initial form, it's just like ya. Yeah but there is a dot, and sin is like this, ein is like that, fa is like that, saat is like that. So you see a lot of parts of the letters are dropped. So this tail is dropped, this tail here is dropped, the, this letter becomes much smaller than here. Here they drop the tail. Also the curl at the end of lamb is dropped and also with calf something happens. Final form, so jim is three, dal is four, he is five, wow is six, Zain is seven, Ha is eight, and Ta is nine. So that's how the system works. And now there is the, uh, your first exercise in writing Arabic. So this is for the, uh, imagine the parents of the students at university, it was their first exercise. As you see, the places 92 to 99 are empty in the table. Use your pencil to write these numbers in the table in the abject system. So everybody can do this. Also the, uh, people whose uh, language is Arabic. So did you finish or do you need more time? Yeah. I can't hear you. Uh, finished. Okay, finished. Okay, well, this is going to be very easy for you. Of course, the answer is like this. And now we have the first real exercise. Uh, I have exercises 7a, 7b and 7c. 7a is very easy for, I hope, maybe not, but. I hope that 7a will be easy for people who already know Arabic and they can go on with 7b and 7c. 
for those uh, who do not know the Arabic alphabet very well, they will need some more time for 7a. Now 7a is the Abjad system was used in medieval Arabic scientific instruments. Photo one on your handout displays an astrolabe that was made by Zia Odin from Lahore, Pakistan in the 17th century. The diameter is 170 millimeters. So here is a photo of the astrolabe. You all have this. And your question is, read the numbers on the outer scale. So you start here with this number and you go like this. They do not look exactly as the printed numbers, but they are sort of similar to this. So you try to read all these numbers. The best way is to write the numbers with the pencil. So if you have figured out a number, you write uh, the interpretation with pencil uh, on the outside. And maybe there are some numbers which you cannot read, and then you will uh, uh, you do you leave it open. And later, if you see a structure, then you can also fill those out. So please uh, take a few minutes to do this this exercise. In two minutes, I will introduce the exercises 7b and 7c to the Arabic students and the others can continue with 7a then. What about the Arabic uh, people? Have they finished? Not Can yet. Them? Not yet. Okay, good. So this is a real exercise, right? It's very good. Anybody wants to see the next exercise? Is anybody who has already finished? Yes, one one person finished. I no one is uh, no. I I don't I don't think they have finished the problem. 
Okay, well then they can. Uh, well, I mean, I am I am there for you. So wait, wait. Uh, can you just tell me when uh, when I should introduce uh, uh, exercise seven B and seven C? We we are not going to do the, to do this exercise completely, but I know how much the uh, people in uh, United Arab Emirates and elsewhere in the Arabic world love their language and their calligraphy. So therefore, I have some special exercise uh, 7b and 7c also because uh, professor fernini uh, was talking about the loss of uh, al andalus so i always like to show people uh, what was done in al andalus uh, in the field of uh, islamic science but that will be 7b and 7c so the writing multiple six then eh? pardon six multiple six multi-purpose adding six the first digit is i can't i can't hear you can you speak slow please Six and six plus six, 12, then 18, 24, 32. Yeah, 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 yeah. Correct? Yeah, it's correct, yeah. I can, ah. uh, yeah, it is, the instrument is called Astrolabe. So I can, I have the uh, the answer here. So sorry, the photo is a little ugly, but it just starts with six, then 12, 18, 24, 30, 36, 42, 48, 54, 60, and so on. You probably you have figured out some of these numbers. But if you have uh, not found all the numbers, you can you can look at this again later. And it's just a circle which is divided into 360 degrees. So it says six degrees, which is here, 12 degrees, which is there, 18 here, 24 there. So it's just we would write uh, the numbers one, two, 360 here. And they were always using abjad. So they were writing these numbers in abjad. And basically, it is a unit of time, because a whole day was divided into 360, what the Arabs called azman, which means the singular zaman, which means time. So one day is 360 times in uh, Islamic astronomy. Okay. Any okay. questions about this first exercise? Anybody who wants any to ask any question about it? Just hold on, bro. Anyone wants to ask any question? Yeah. Sir, why it become multiple of six? Why is it started from six? Why six? Uh, I uh, what, what other possibilities would you, you cannot write all the numbers here? I mean, there's not enough space to write uh, one, two, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So you can have either multiple of six or multiple of five, because the number thirty is very important. Thirty is uh, three hundred sixty is twelve times thirty, and also here you see the inner circle, which is ecliptic. It is also divided into. Uh, 12 uh, sections of 30 degrees. So the number 30 is very important. So you have to have uh, an indication of 30. So therefore the possibilities you have are 30 is five times six, in which case you write six, 12, 18, 24, 30, or also on other astrolabes you have a six times five. So then they write five, 10, 15, 20, 20 25, 30. Does that answer your question? Yes. Okay. Any more questions at this moment? No, in that case, I will just show you the odd, this, okay, the second no, exercise. No, no, no. Pardon? I have one question. Yeah, okay. What is it? It is so simple to write the numbers. Why do they use abjad here? Uh, that is the, uh, the other way around. I mean, people were, to them, uh, abjad was very simple because that was what they learned. And the Hindi, Hindu Arabic numbers were very new and very difficult. And so in the beginning, in uh, the Islamic tradition, almost no one was using them. And uh, in the European tradition, uh, a lot of uh, there were people who were trying to make fraudulent contracts. I mean, they they wrote something and then they said, for example, the price is uh, two. So they write a symbol for two. And the next day when you have to pay, they say, no, it's not two, but three. So for a time, uh, Hindu Arabic numbers were even forbidden in Italy. So therefore, something which you know is always uh, easier to use than something which you do not know. But this is the way we look at history. We look, uh, we are determined by our own education. So because we have learned the Hindu Arabic, we think that that is simple. But historically That's speaking, it's not the case. 
okay sir i uh, uh, shall i add one more thing yes please uh, usually arabic is writing from right to left yes but while we are using usual numbers we are writing left to right yeah but in this system we are writing left to right as here in the form of arabic itself yeah he yeah he we here we are writing uh, right to left because for example right to left right to left yeah as, yeah. as arabic writing yeah as arabic writing yes indeed that, that may be one of the reason maybe maybe you're right yeah, yeah maybe yeah well anyway i mean hindu arabic maybe you remember from your primary school that it was quite difficult in the beginning but at least i remember that so one more clarification in the abjad series we could see abjad hutti kalaman shaufas karshat wa mailadar and so on why we uh, we stop here uh, up to the letter swa only in the series we could see some more letters in the arabic yeah yeah abjad hawaz hutti kalaman shaufas karshat three more letter three, three or five or letters also is there any, anything to be added here on yeah i mean this this what i did is really really i only uh, brought the abjad abjad which you need for the exercises so for this exercise and also in astronomy you need until 300 because you have to you have to number 360 later uh, in uh, exercise 7b and 7c you have this astrolabe that you see here from andalusia so the uh, the the maximum number that you need here is 500 so therefore i did not want to extend beyond that but you, there are uh, symbols until 1000 and above 1000 it becomes difficult it it can be done i mean you can re start repeating the the number for 2 and then the number for 1000 but it's more difficult uh, professor i think some there are questions online can you check please uh, online uh, so adilla I, adilla do i open the q and a or the chat on chat box a q and a sorry q and a yeah yeah there is uh, why they used abjad letters and astrolabe instead of numbers well this is uh, as i said i mean because the numbers numbers that we know are were very unfamiliar to them and they already knew the letters of the alphabet so the alphabet is something that they uh, knew already by the way um do you know uh, maybe you remember from school when you do geometry you write a triangle abc do you remember that yes yes well have you ever asked yourself why do we write abc the answer is before first for the greeks the greeks also used abjad so a was one so it's the really first point b was two so it's the really, uh, second point and c was three and right. islamic uh, scholars they called the letters of the geometrical figure they called the numbers I mean, takiuddin says they are the numbers al arqam alif ba jin So really, the, what we were using in geometrical figures is also numbers, not letters. But we have forgot, forgotten that. Uh, can I ask a question myself, Professor? Yes, of course. Uh, why then there was a need for this? For what? For numbers? For abjad numbering. For well, um, let let me explain the reason why they started to do that. I mean, there is before numbers existed. I mean, numbers is something that was uh, developed rather late in the tradition. I mean, the Hindu Arabic numbers were were developed in India, and then they were introduced into the Arabic world by Khwarezmi. And of course, the, before Khwarezmi, there were many people doing things in science. Um, so, uh, the, the, why were they were they necessary in science? You always have to deal with numbers, and so the Greeks uh, were also using using a sign of abjad. and in astronomy usually they uh, what they did is they used the 60 base uh, system which we still use we use uh, hours minutes seconds do you know why do we use one hour is 60 minutes and one minute is 60 seconds why do you know why we use that no uh, it's my question to you do you do you, does anybody know that why do we why do we use one hour is 60 minutes and one minute is 60 seconds the answer is because that is what the muslims did in astronomy so that's why the europeans uh, uh, accepted that from the muslims the muslims accepted that from the greeks and the greeks accepted that from the babylonians so it's a traditional way one hour is 60 minutes one minute is 60 seconds now if you are computing like that usually for minutes and seconds you never need any numbers higher than 60 so therefore if you have abjad 
you only need abstract numbers from one to 59 and also a symbol for zero. So that is not so, not so difficult. And therefore, there, if you are used to that sort of computation, there is no real need for Hindu Arabic numbers because if, there, if you have a number system which works, maybe not perfect, but it works, why accept a completely new system if it has no clear advantage? There is also, if I may add here, just for the audience here, uh, in Macedonia, I, I come from Macedonia, and my in my family, the, the, the correspondence among my father and my grandfather was in num with numbers. Mm. The, the the communication was was with numbers, and uh, uh, for instance, when you write Allah. You know, a lot of people, they carry muska, they call it muska, to prevent you from the evil eye or something. Yeah. So they will write, instead of writing Allah, because you are going to the washroom, toilet, and to respect the Allah, they were converting into uh, numbering, numbers. Yeah, yeah. So I have a, I have something on my, inside of my uh, kind of, uh, what they call bracelet, yes. It is with numbers. Uh, nice, and yeah. It is very, Yes, sorry, That's Prof. I just wanted to add. Yeah, very good, very good. Yeah, it's exactly the same system. So the same traditional system, which is Abjad, was also used in that way. Yeah, I also remember from uh, from my visits to Iran that uh, uh, the word Hua uh, is very important in mysticism, and that's 11. So the number 11 was important for them. That's Ha is five and Wa is six. Uh, there is a question in Arabic, Prof. The question will be in Arabic. Okay. Can you translate uh, it? Yes, doctor. Uh, you know Arabic, yeah? Yeah, yeah? But, but, but please, uh, <laughs> can someone translate it? Because I can try to understand it, but maybe my spoken Arabic is not so good. Okay. I'm just surprised that the days, I think that the days, for example, January, February, March, are essentially the days of English. I'm surprised that it's written in the Arabic language, and it's written in the Arabic فهني صار عندي يعني أنا استغربت يعني أن مكتوبة هذه الشهور أنا ظننت أنها شهور جاءت يعني من الغرب شكرا جزيلا. So the question is whether the uh, the months are, are coming from the west is that uh, the the question is that you know why in astrologies uh, the uh, months are mentioned in in like January Yanair April oh, here. It's why this, not it, it this this is uh, so the question is about the second astrolabe about exercise seven B and seven C right? I mean yes, this sir. is this is an astrolabe from Al Andalus. Yeah, and here it says, uh, uh, and in Al Andalus they were uh, dealing with two different calendars, and basically what is always very important is the position of the sun. Uh, we will come back to that, and if you know uh, the date in the uh, Christian calendar. It's very easy to uh, have the approximate uh, position of the sun from, from that date. For example, now we are January 9. And in the second part of this uh, exposition, we will uh, see that then the sun is in Capricorn 19. So if you are January 9, the position is always very close to Capricorn 19. So, but in the Islamic calendar, it's a lunar calendar. The uh, seasons, uh, they are... Uh, uh, circulating through the month. So after 30 years, after the cycle of 30 years, Ramadan is uh, back in the same part of the year where it was in the beginning. Now in the same astrolabe, you also have some, some of the, uh, the Islamic name. There is this Shuhur here, Shuhur, and it has Muharram there, the Al Muharram. And then there are letters which have uh, Safar, uh, Rabi al Awal, Rabi al Thani, Jumad al Awal, Jumad al Thani, Rajab, Shaban, Ramadan, Shawal. Uh, so the Islamic uh, calendar is also there. So actually both calendars are there. And if you do uh, question 7c, you are asked to read the numbers in the middle of this astrolabe. And this is basically uh, something that relates to the Islamic calendar. And if you want to know what it is, you can look the uh, extra material on the website, which uh, explains all of that. Thank you. Uh, okay. One more, I think there is one more. Okay, one more. Yeah, I like to to have questions, but after that, uh, we will go back to the second part of the presentation. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. 
the normal order which we studied from madrasa and i think you know all over the world alif ba ta sa ji mu this is the normal order i think yes you you are right. very good but, question but why they changed in numbering into a new order abujid hawaz yeah this is the very very good question so why don't we have the order alif is 1 ba is 2 Uh, and what's the next uh, ta is three sa is four and so on right this is what logical uh i think the answer to that can there are different answers to that question i mean the order of the abjad in arabic very much uh is very similar to the order of the abjad in greek uh in greek they have alif is no alpha is one beta is two gamma is three so therefore one can understand why in arabic the the translators they used Uh, alif is one, ba is two, jim is three because jim is sort of similar to gamma, and then dal is similar to delta. This is four, so that's one explanation. The second explanation is that in certain certain other alphabets which are related to Arabic alphabet, for example Phoenician alphabet, and also others, they already had the same uh, abjad uh, system. So also uh, alif one, ba two, jim three. Uh, Dal four. So uh, the answer is uh, it's not an answer of logic, but it's an answer of tradition. Thank you, Prof. We okay. may continue now. Okay, we uh, continue. So uh, I hope you find these exercises exciting. So continue with them in your own time, and if you have any question, you can always uh, write to me. Now I will try to find the second part of uh, my presentation. Uh, let's see how this uh, will work. Uh, to open this again. You you see my screen, right? With the okay. Now I want to have full screen. Okay. Do you see the screen uh, now? Yes. Okay. So it's part two. So um, I am going to present some examples to you in an interactive way. And we are going to look at the work of Shams al-Din al-Khalili. There should be L between the two eyes. Uh, who was Muwakkit and also at some point Muazzin of the Umayyad Mosque in Damascus. I'm very pleased that Professor Fernini also mentioned the Umayyad Mosque and also the colleague uh, Ibn Shatir who was uh, working there. So always uh, I will do a little exercise with you. When we are studying the old tradition, it's very good to mentally travel back in time. That means we have to delete from our mind some things that uh, we are used to today. And we already saw that with the numbers. We have to delete our uh, familiarity with certain numbers. And so uh, we go back to uh, through the centuries. So from 2023 back to 1923, we have to delete from our mind smartphones, internet, computer, and television. Okay, so imagine how your life would be different without these uh, these things. Then, from 1923 back to 1823, you delete airplane, cars, radio, telephone, electricity. So then becomes much more difficult to communicate, and that makes the communication that existed much more amazing. You also see from that time, Hajj uh, was also very important to bring people together. From 1823 back to 1600, you delete the photo camera, the telescope, and the microphone, the microscope, sorry, microphone later. And then uh, back to 1360, delete from your mind all printed books. Also, photocopy machine did not exist. So, If you wanted to have a copy of a text, you would have to write it by your own hand, or you would ask someone else to write it for you. So this is a little uh, preparation. So you have already seen this uh, uh, sheet. I wanted to talk about the scientific tradition in Islamic civilization related to Islamic law, and uh, because that, why do I do that? Because that makes the Islamic scientific tradition different from the others. There are also, for example, the scientific tradition of India, the scientific tradition of Greece, and the scientific tradition of the Jews, the Hebrew tradition. And to what extent was the Islamic tradition different? 
because there were these problems related to Islamic religion and related to Islamic law, which were studied by the scientists. And I think there is something very special about that. Also because uh, look at finding the direction of Mecca, finding the Qibla. It is not necessary to see this as a scientific problem. Because you can also say, okay, we want to pray in the general direction of Mecca. And this is what people did in the early, uh, maybe the early two centuries of Islam. But later people thought, oh, we have to really make this into a scientific problem. And that involves a lot of uh, things because then you, if you know that the earth is a sphere, you have to find the radius of the sphere in order to, to uh, get all the mathematics you need to find the Qibla. How do you find the radius of the earth? A very interesting question. How could Al-Khalili know that the earth is a sphere and find its radius? Very interesting. So I'm not going to give an answer because the question is much more interesting than the answer, especially for high school students. I think it's very good to think for them to think about these questions. Now I was going uh, to talk about uh, Qibla finding methods and to show Khalili's uh, Qibla table. And I will uh, do that. But first, some literature. David King, whom I have already mentioned, has written this marvelous book on world maps for finding the direction and distance to Mecca, which uh, I think it's 900 pages and it has a lot of information. And you can probably download it uh, from his uh, website. And then if you want to have an introduction, I have a talk which I gave at Umal Kura University, and you can find the link on the web page for today. So it is, uh, you see the address of the web page, but it's incomplete because uh, the ML has disappeared uh, behind the book. So uh, a general introduction to the history of Qibla finding methods, I am skipping that uh, because you can easily find that in the literature. And so what I want to show to you is this Qibla table by Al-Khalili which was published by Professor David King in 1975. To the left, you see a page from his article. And he showed that the Qibla table is extremely accurate because here you have values for 22 degrees. This is latitude 22, 23, 24, 25. Here you have Khalili's values, 78, 24, 78, 39, etc. And these are the errors if you compare to modern computation. So it's almost nothing. And usually there's nothing, so there is not even an error. So uh, this is not easy, this uh, mathematics. So it's really amazing that Khalili was able to publish, uh, to, to compute this very accurately. So this is to the left. And to the right is one page of the manuscript in Paris, which you can just download on your laptop. So I have a link in my webpage, so you can just download the whole manuscript. So. I was going to prepare this and I had written this nice summary for my paper and uh, was looking at this. And of course, I downloaded the whole manuscript from the internet. So I did that. But uh, unfortunately, I found something even more interesting than uh, the Qibla table. And this was in the end of December 2022. So it was when I was preparing this talk. So, and these were the prayer tables for Damascus also computed by the same Al-Khalili, which are mathematically even more challenging. So you see, this is a page from the prayer tables. Those of you who read Arabic can read Amal, Mawakit, Anahar, Walail. So this is all for prayer uh, tables. And now here you will recognize this whole area, all abject numbers, it's only abject. Now this uh, table had been mentioned by David King but it had never been published. So he had said that it was there. And I think there was even a photo of one page, but no one had ever looked at these tables and no one ever tried to recompute them and to see how accurate they were. And this uh, it was shocking to me. So I thought, wow, wow this Khalili, uh, he is so special. And he was able to compute these things so accurately. And no one has ever looked at his, his, his prayer tables. How can this be? So, but as I said, this happens all the time. So also if you download some manuscripts from the internet, you will probably find something which has never been looked at. So um, 
Now for prayer tables and Qibla tables and other tables, there is also another book by David King uh, called In Synchrony with the Heavens, Volume 1, Leiden 2005. This is almost 1,000 pages. Because there he mentions many tables and has many photos. But there are so many tables, it's really an ocean. I mean, this whole Islamic tradition, it was an, old, an ocean. And so he has this enormous book in which he has many references and many manuscripts, but it does not exhaust the subject. And of course, they were not only for Damascus, but also for Jerusalem, for Cairo, and for other cities in the Islamic world. So it's really David King's uh, life work to uh, make all this material accessible in some sense. I mean, he has told us that it's there. But of course, one person with a few students, I'm also one of his students, by the way, that is not enough to investigate all of this. So um, what is a prayer table? Here is uh, a modern prayer table for Sharjah for uh, this moment. You see for today, January 9, you see the time of Fajr prayer, the sunrise, then uh, Zohar, uh, Asr prayer, beginning of Asr, Maghreb uh, and Isha. So you see the uh, sunrise and the five prayers there. Now see how I can uh, continue. And so, uh, oh, sorry. Uh, Khalili was also doing uh, things like that. So what I did was uh, I took the prayer tables. I mean, there were six, six uh, 12 pages in the manuscript, six table, tables, and I have typed all of them. So I changed the abjad to Hindu Arabic numbers. So this is what you have then. You have uh, 30 rows of numbers. Every page runs from one to 30 with uh, these columns, which I have called A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, J, K, L, because there is no uh, space to have exactly the uh, Arabic titles. So you see lots of numbers here. These numbers have the same information and even more than in the uh, uh, modern Qibla tables, for example, for Charja. But this is for Damascus, for the time of Khalili. So uh, what I will do now, I will first explain to you how to find today's prayer times for Damascus from Khalili's table. So as you have seen, I called these uh, columns uh, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, J, K, L, M. And there is X at the beginning and Y at the end. And here you can see what the columns are in the Arabic manuscript. I changed uh, the direction. Arabic runs from uh, right to left. And in my transcription, it's of course from left to right. So what do these uh, A, B, C, etc. mean? Well, X means Burj al Hamal. This is sign areas. Uh, this has, by the way, this has nothing to do with astrology. People think of astrology, but at that time it was simply the way to uh, to indicate the position of the sun. Then A is maximum altitude of the sun. You can even read it, I mean, you have to turn your head perhaps. B is half the day arc, that's the time from noon to sunset. C is the hours per day. And unfortunately, this is black and white, uh, but in the library, it's of course in color. I would love to see this in color. Be probably it's very beautiful. Then D is uh, altitude of the sun at the beginning of Asar. It says Ertefa al Asar, you can read here. E is time between noon and beginning of Asr. It says Da'ir al-Asr, which that means time between noon and beginning of Asr. Then F is time between beginning of Asr and sunset. In Arabic, Ma'bain al-Asr, or I think it says. Then G is time between noon and end of Asr. Ma'bain al-Azur, I think, Akhar waktu al-Asr, it says. Then H, a nice night arc calls a lail. Uh, then duration of dusk, it's, so it's the time between sunset and uh, that's the, the sky being completely black. K is the time between dusk and dawn. And L is duration of dawn at the morning. You, know, you have to know that for Fajr prayer. And then M is something special. It's the time interval between the moment when the sun faces the Qibla and noon. Because in Damascus, the Qibla is a little bit west of south. 
And so the sun will be in the direction of Qibla maybe one or one and a half hours before noon. And uh, Al Khalili computed exactly that amount. So you know when the sun, uh, at that moment, you know that the sun exactly indicates the uh, direction of Qibla. So that's a lot. So how to find today's prayer times in Damascus from that? Now today is January 9. So we find from an astronomical table that the sun is in Capricorn 19. So therefore we take the root, the row for 19 in the table. So go back. The table looks like this. And we go to 19. We can't say it, see it here, but it is there. Now you know Abjad. So you can also find the numbers in the uh, Paris manuscript. For example, here B, it says 7421. You have the 74 here, Ein da, and the 21 here. And C is 955. The Ta is 9. It's for both. And the 55 is here. So uh, someone asked, is this reliable? And I think, yes, it is reliable. And if you doubt, you can just check it on the uh, internet. So for uh, January 19, we find in the table, the maximum altitude of the sun is 34 degrees, 20 minutes above the horizon. That's when the sun is exactly in the south. Then B is a time between noon and sunset. That's 74 time degrees, in Arabic time degrees is Saman, plus this 21 means 21 over 60 time degrees. What is time degrees? Time degrees is the unit for the astrolabe. I mean, that's what you have seen in your exercise 7a. I mean, that is because the, on the side of the astrolabe, the uh, 6, 12, 18, 24, 30, and so on are time degrees. And that means one day is 360 time degrees. So one hour is 15 time degrees. One time degree is four minutes. And you can convert that into hours, minutes, and seconds that we need that we use today is four hours, 57 minutes and 24 seconds. So that means that sunset is four hours, 57 minutes and 24 seconds afternoon. And then C is the number of hours between sunrise and sunset, nine hours, 20, 20, 55 minutes. These are our normal hours, it goes on. D is the altitude of the sun at the beginning of Asr prayer. 22 minutes, uh, sorry, 22 degrees, six minutes above the horizon. E is the time between noon and the beginning of Asr prayer in time degrees. So it's 40 plus 53 over 60 time degrees. It makes it easy to find this moment by an astrolabe. If you convert it in hours, it's two hours, 43 minutes, 32 seconds. F is time between beginning of Asr prayer and sunset. 32 time degrees, 20 plus 29 over 60. Uh, G, time between noon and end of Asr prayer, because Asr prayer ends sometime before sunset. 51 plus 7 over 60 time degrees, 3 hours, 24 minutes and 28 seconds. So now you can compute the time between the beginning and end of Asr prayer, 1 hour, 10 minutes, 32 seconds. J, I will uh, skip H. J is duration of dusk between sunset, completely dark sky, 21 time degrees plus 56 over 60. L, I uh, also skip K, L is duration of dawn. That's between completely dark sky and sunrise. 24 plus 24 over 60 time degrees, one hour, 37 minutes and 37, six seconds. So I hope you will forgive me for having changed the subject of my talk a little bit because I was completely excited about all this information, not only me, I also showed to Hussein Chen, he says, this is unbelievable. He, we have to do something with it. And also to some of my colleagues in uh, the Department of Mathematics, they also said, this is really incredible. You will have to publish it. So we hope to publish it soon. And the next question of course is, how did Khalili compute these data and are they uh, accurate? Now I'm going, to be a little bit technical, but you can just uh, uh, check it. It's, there are some spelling mistakes which I can correct. So using astronomical parameter values and trigonometry, trigonometry means a sine cosine tangent function. If you don't know trigonometry, doesn't matter. You just have to realize this is something that people learn in the higher grades in high school. I mean, people who are students who are uh, planning to specialize in 
mathematics or physics or engineering. So it was completely known to the Islamic tradition. They knew all the uh, difficulties of that. They also used that dusk ends when the sun is 17 degrees below the horizon and dawn begins when the sun is 19 degrees below the horizon. Of course, how are you going to find uh, this out? Not by computation. Here is some very specialized scientific work going on to end, to end up with these parameter values. The obliquity of the ecliptic, something mentioned by Professor Fernini. This is ne necessary for the computation of the sun. That was uh, 30, 23 degrees, 31 minute, minutes. This was a result measured by a contemporary astronomer from Damascus, Ibn Ashatir, who has also been mentioned by Professor Fernini. The assumption is also that Asr begins when the shadow is equal to the shadow at noon plus one times the gnomon. And Asr ends when the shadow is the shadow at noon plus two times the gnomon. What is the gnomon? The gnomon is a vertical stick which you put at the horizontal plane and it has a shadow. So it has a noon shadow. You take the noon shadow and you add the gnomon and then you have the shadow at the beginning of Asr. You add the gnomon again. Then you have the shadow at the end of Asr. This is fully explained in the article by David King, which I, I think I have assigned to you. Uh, you should have received a copy, and if not, you can find it on the web page for today. So now, uh, were these computations difficult? Yeah, they were difficult. Uh, here are the formulas. Uh, don't look at the details, but it just uh, shows you that there is a lot of trigonometry, sine function, tangent function, cosine function involved in here. I'm not going into these uh, details. There is some auxiliary quantity altitude for the sun at the end of Asr prayer, which he also had to compute, but which is not listed in this table. So I have used these formulas for my recomputation of the table. It has not been finished yet, but I have already found that the tables were very accurately computed. So here we have a result from the Islamic scientific tradition namely the tables that were computed by Khalili, which were very accurate. So one can of course compare them with modern prayer times for Damascus for today. If you want to do that, I mean, I've printed some tables. You have to change the modern tables a little bit because Dohar, I mean, it's at 12, around 1240 in Damascus, but that's because we have time zones. We uh, do not have the, uh, time that they used at that time. They used local time, sundial time. The noon is always at 12 o'clock. Nowadays we have time zones, so in Damascus the noon is later than 12 o'clock. Also, the sunrise uh, for modern prayer tables is different from the sunrise in Khalili's prayer tables, because in his prayer tables it is the rise of the center of the sun. And in modern tables it's the rising of the uh, upper part of the disk. Also, Khalili did not take refraction into account, which is a bending of the light, although that was known in the Islamic tradition and the news uh, knew about it. So you can compute it and then you, you can compare it and you see that uh, the, uh, the, the, the results are pretty accurate, although there are some changes because some of the definitions are not exactly the same. So uh, if this is not enough, I want uh, to look at the Qibla table of Al-Khalili in workshop form, but maybe we can pause, uh, maybe there are some questions. If uh, there are one or two questions, uh, you can ask them now, and I will uh, now change uh, the screen again. So I will wait, uh, I will continue after one or two people have asked questions, and if there are no questions, then I will not continue. I mean, so this is usually the best way to, uh, to proceed. It seems like we don't have any questions at the moment. That's very bad. Then it's just, I will just wait until there are questions. <laughs> are you sure no questions? It's usually when a speaker talks like me, people are sort of confused and amazed. So they have to sort of get back to themselves, find themselves and ask a question. There are no silly questions. There are no stupid questions. So ask any question you like, but I will wait until people have asked two questions because I want the people to be active. Otherwise, 
if you are in these very comfortable chairs where you are, your chairs are much more comfortable than my chair, by the way. So you sort of doze away. This is uh, pleasant, but not always good. So I wait. Uh, professor, do you hear me? Yeah. Do you hear me well? Yeah, I do. Uh, yeah, first sure. of all, thank you for your uh, applied lecture, actually. So uh, thank you for your workshop. And my first question will be in the beginning of the lecture, you mentioned that it will be great for people who know Arabic or who teach Arabic to non-Arabs. Yeah. So as I don't know Arabic and I don't teach Arabic, how this workshop will be helpful for people who don't know Arabic and don't teach Arabic? Because you, uh, it's very uh, easy to familiarize yourself with the workshop, especially we have now part two of the workshop. So you will uh, read some manuscripts and you will uh, be familiar with the manuscripts. And then um, if you are in an audience where people know uh, some mathematics, or at least they don't hate it, and they are familiar with numbers, then you can show a manuscript to them and say, this is uh, one of the, it's the best Qibla tables that was produced in the Islamic tradition. Do you want to read it? And probably will say, yes, we want to read it. And then you will teach the workshop for 20 minutes, and then people will be able to read it. I mean, this is my, it's my experience that, especially among Muslims who do not know Arabic, uh, it uh, generates a lot of enthusiasm. I mean, I remember in this hotel in uh, Lefkosha in Northern Cyprus, where we were teaching, people became very fanatic and they could not stop. Uh, thank you for your answer. Then uh, maybe uh, your workshop can be included as a, as a kind of uh, activity to stem or games for high school or for, I don't know, for any school, I guess. Of course, I would uh, like to do that. And as you see, I have now the I have now made the workshop completely online. I mean, this is the first time I have done this uh, with the, uh, the 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 so the handout that you see now is not the handout that you have received, but it is a handout which has the questions and also the answers. So these are the questions. Uh, for example, a que first there are some nice pictures to look at, and then there is questions, and after that there is the questions with the answers. So. You don't give the handout like this to the students, but you, you uh, take it to yourself as teacher. And so then you can prepare yourself and you can teach the workshop. It's very easy. Thank you very much. So the workshop, I mean, one, uh, the members of my team, this is also very interesting. I usually travel with two, two colleagues. I mean, one of them is a mathematics teacher and the other is uh, the manager of the mathematics program in our department. Both of them do not know Arabic, but both of them have, have learned the Arabic alphabet and they are teaching the Abjad workshop. The Abjad workshop is always being taught by one of them. And they also assist me in the uh, workshops on the astrolabe where we read the Arabic inscriptions. It works very well. And the, the one thing is also, this is, I think this is what we need uh, in today's world because we need to get together. And it, the, the Arabic culture has adapted a lot to the West. I mean, Dr. Fanini uh, told this at the end of his workshop. And this is something that I have also observed because the Western technology has been accepted so much by the Islamic world, it sort of changes their culture in unpleasant ways. How to uh, act against that? I think one way would be also to teach workshops like this in the Western world. The people uh, usually very much, they, they enjoy it very much. And they also get acquainted and become more familiar with uh, the Islamic tradition and Islamic science and don't see this anymore as something dangerous, but they see this as something very valuable. And if they see with their own eyes that someone like Al-Khalili could use this mathematics to compute this, and mathematics never changes. It, it, the mathematics that he used is still valuable today. So that can also be used to sort of uh, uh, encourage the unity in the world. And that is also the reason why I think uh, uh, these workshops are uh, useful. They can be can help very little bit in order to uh, achieve that goal. Thank you. We have another question.
uh, sir, you shown a table uh, from the Damascus. Uh, yeah. Can we make uh, such table for other uh, places also? Of course. If so, uh, if if so, uh, what is the base of that one? The the uh, essential uh, thing you have to put in is the geographical coordinates for Damascus. And most of the table, it means all the columns except the last one, they can be computed uh, if you only have geographical latitudes. That's 33 degrees and 30 minutes. So that means that almost all the columns are valid for any city which has the, ge the same geographical latitude as Damascus, 33 degrees and 30 minutes. For Qibla, you also need the longitude. So, um, in principle, yes, this is very easy. And this is also what the people did because they were also computing similar tables for Jerusalem, uh, for Cairo, for Istanbul, cities which do not have the same geographical latitude as Damascus. And I'm sure there were also tables like that for Lahore uh, in Pakistan com computed and maybe also for Delhi uh, now in India. So yes, it can be done. It can be done using the same mathematics. And the people who were living at that time in Damascus, this Khalili, they were able to do that. Uh, Professor, I think there is a question by on, online by Yasemin. Okay, go ahead. Can I can I uh, see the question? Yes, it is. Is it in, in chat? Q &A. It, yeah, in Q and A. Uh, so I Let see that the timing in Al Khalil is was longer and much more divide. So how come that it is shorter now? Uh, the timing, you mean, what do you mean by timing? Do you mean the unit of time? Maybe, maybe I, I guess so. Maybe the question is why do we use hours and uh, Al Khalili use time degrees and the time degree is uh, four minutes. So it's a, a unit is shorter. And um, yeah, the, so the unit is shorter and therefore the amount of time, the numbers are higher. So we have, for example, five hours between uh, noon and sunset and in Khalili, this was uh, 75 time degrees. Uh, I think basically uh, for Khalili, the unit of time was uh, determined by the timekeeping instrument that he had. And that was the astrolabe. The astrolabe was the most, the most accurate instrument there were also other instruments like uh, water clocks, but uh, for him as a scientist, the astrolabe was uh, the instrument that he used and therefore his time unit was determined by that. And uh, for us, why do we use hours? Well, we subdivide the hour. So we subdivide it in minutes and we subdivide the minutes in seconds. I think the reason why we use hours is that one doesn't want to have uh, a very big uh, time or very big numbers in normal life. So for us, 12 hours or 25 hour, 24 hours in a day is enough. If we have 60 or 70 hours a day, there are more, uh, more subdivisions and so there's more confusion. Also, I think the 12 hours makes it easy to have uh, modern clocks with a dial where you have the two hands of a clock. So that works well when you have 12 hours, but if you would have uh, 360 time units uh, or time degrees, it wouldn't work that well. I mean, this is sort of my my answer to that. The reason why we use hours is, is also from tradition. I think basically the system was invented in Egypt. It was used uh, in Greece only by the scientists and in the Islamic civilization also only by scientists. In this way, it was uh, transmitted to Europe. Then when the Europe's invented uh, mechanical clocks, uh, for mechanical clocks, this is really uh, very important to have always the same number of hours during the day and during the night. So always, uh, so in winter and in summer. In the old times, in civil lives, you would have hours in such a way that the time between sunrise and sunset was always 12 hours. So that means that hours in summer are longer than hours in winter. And this is very difficult if you have a mechanism. So then uh, when the mechanisms became popular, then they shifted to these uh, scientific hours. So there's sort of a, a little answer to that question. So shall we continue with the workshop now? Yes, please. Because I, I don't want to keep, uh, you to, I think we should uh, stop in about 15 minutes because you will be mostly unconscious. But this is the printout you have. 
So if you look at the screen, you see again the table with the abjet numbers. That's again the Eastern system. But now uh, the letters are provided with dots. Usually the dots are omitted, but Ba has a dot, which you can see here, and Jim has a dot, and Zai has a dot. So sometimes when the people who wrote the manuscripts were very diligent, they would also put the dots. Uh, then one thing uh, we have to know is that if P and Q are abjad numbers, then the combination PQ in Arabic can mean Q plus P over 60. And this is what we have seen in the prayer tables. So if we have Jim Zain from uh, left to right, we can use that for three plus seven over 60. And it can mean an angle of three degrees and seven minutes. So that's also one thing you have to know. And when you know that, you can read the Qibla table. So I will now show you Qibla table. So this is uh, one page in the Qibla table of Khalili in the Paris manuscript. So it's not in David King's article. So you see some uh, words here in Arabic and under this uh, line, it's all numbers. So what you see on the screen is all abjad numbers. So using the 20 minutes workshop, which we have done, you can read all these numbers. There's only one number that you have to add. It's this V here. You see the V? That's the zero. We have not yet uh, treated with that. Here you see, uh, ah, this is five. This is not zero, but the V is zero. So because you have to be able to say, uh, well, actually this is uh, 83 degrees and zero minutes. This is the Paris manuscript. The more, uh, the, the quality of the, uh, uh, online version is usually quite good. So if you enlarge it a little bit, you can uh, see it like this. It's all abject numbers, but mostly with the dots. So they have this, the same with the dot. Also the ya, here is ya, ya ba. So this is 12 with the two dots. For Jim, so it says Jim has a dot here. So the scribe, the person who wrote this was very diligent. This was not the only page. The manuscript has maybe 90 pages with numbers or nine zero pages with numbers like this. Unbelievable. This is the lower part of the same page. This is nice because we can use this to see the Qibla in Sharjah. So I want, I want you to find Qibla in Sharjah from this table because the mathematics that he used is still valued, valid. So we should be able to find it. This is Berlin manuscript. It's not as good as the Paris manuscript, but it is in color. And notice some of the numbers are red and others are black. This has a meaning also. Here's the, the lower part of that page. You have these things in your handout and you can read this, uh, this all you can read later. So we will first look at this uh, page in uh, the first row of numbers in photos four and six on your handout from right to left. And the question is to locate the numbers that you see. So here are, you can now see on the screen the first two lines of numbers. And the question to look, to look for you is just to look for these numbers. Seven, 127, 37, 97, and then this number, which means 80 plus 21 over 60. That's 80 degrees, 27 minutes. And this number, which means 88 plus 56 over 60, which means 88 degrees, 56 numbers. And then also read the other numbers in the first row. This is the first row. So look and see if you can find these numbers. You finished? Can someone speak to me, please? 
Uh, hold on, Prof. Are we done? A minute, Prof. Okay. Now you are really connecting to tradition. You are uh, reading your old uh, stuff. This is very good. Thank you. I have made a screenshot of uh, the hall, which I can show to my wife. Uh, this will be very good. Are we done? Two more minutes, Prof, I guess. Okay. That's fine. Prof, we are told that they, they have done it. Okay, good. So just, uh, uh, you see my screen, right? With the arrow, do you see the arrow? Yes. Okay, yes. so here, here we have seven, 127, 37, 97. And then here we have the first number that's 80 plus 27 over 60. This is a, a Kibla value, an angle here. Here we have 88 plus 56 over 60. Then here we have the other numbers. And I have, of course, the answers here. So, so this one is uh, 81 degrees, nine minutes. Then here we have 87 degrees, three minutes, 81 degrees, 52 minutes, and 85 degrees, 10 minutes. So we have uh, read the uh, first line in the table. And that means you can also read the other lines. So now I will briefly explain to you how the table works. So we have, now here I have not changed the order. So the seven and eight here are the seven and eight here. 127, 126 is 127, 126. 37, 38 is 37, 38. 97, 96 is 97, 96. And then we have, here we have two numbers, 80, 27, 80, 46, which are red in the manuscript. I mean, it is not visible here, but it's red. These numbers are black. Above these red numbers is written first number and above the black numbers is written second number. Then here we have two red numbers in the manuscript, two black numbers, first number, second number. Here we have latitude 25, you can see 25 here. Latitude 26, art, calf, wow, this is, and here we have latitude 27, art, calf, sign. Of course, I have taken this page because Sharjah is, uh, I believe uh, latitude 25, because I wanted you to do something for Sharjah. So this is uh, what we have in the, uh, in the manuscript and it continues like this. And then um, how does it work? I show just uh, from, uh, uh, from examples. Suppose we are in the city of Ghat in Libya. Maybe you have never heard about this city, but it is in the desert. And it's nice because it has the right uh, latitude. So the, the latitude of Ghat of, uh, is 25 degrees and the Greenwich longitude is 10 degrees east. But that means in the old system, which Al-Khalili used, it's 37 degrees because he had different system of 
geographical longitude. Of course, not Greenwich, it did not exist at that time. But he has another system. You have to add 27 degrees to the Greenwich and then you get the latitude of the longitude 37 degrees, which uh, Galilee used. So that means we are here in longitude uh, 37 and latitude 25. So you take longitude 37, latitude 25. Latitude 25 means that the Kibla should be somewhere here. And longitude 37 means it's the second number. So we should take the second number here. So we have 8856. But we now have to know what that means. Well, it means in Heraf al Qibla, so deviation of the Qibla from south or from north. But because it is black, it means uh, in Heraf from south. If it's red, it means in Heraf from north. So, and also Ghat is west of Mecca, so the Qibla must be somewhere towards the east. east. So it must be towards the east, but the angle with the south is 88. 56. So from that we can find the Qibla and it turns out to be almost east with one degree four minutes which is a very small angle south of east. So in this way we can use the uh, table to find the Qibla for the city of Ghat. And in view of the time I think you can continue doing this yourself. Uh, Umar Kot in Pakistan was the next uh, and then in China and uh, also Sora, Pakistan, another latitude. In this way, you can practice with the, uh, the uh, numbers. Also, there is an answer on the uh, internet, on the website, so you can check your answers. Also look in the Berlin manuscript. And in the end, of course, uh, the question is the Qibla in Sharjah, also in Dahran, Saudi Arabia, Karachi, Pakistan, and then also Rangpur, Bangladesh and a uh, place in Mauritania, which is interesting because it's west of Greenwich. So you can do all these exercises. And finally here, uh, the Qibla in Sharjah, you find as uh, 7843, that's the Inhiraf from south. And it is also in the manuscript, I show you it's the number here. So really the number for Qibla of Sharjah is in the Paris manuscript and it's also in the Berlin manuscript here. So this you can do when you finish this workshop for yourself. So therefore, what I will do now is uh, I will finish my presentation. It's only uh, a few more minutes. And then if there are uh, questions or uh, answers, you can uh, ask them. Now I have to find full screen again. Can you see the full screen now? Yes. OK, good. So uh, yeah, one thing I also wanted to show to you is one of my favorite things, it has already been shown by Professor Fernini in his talk also. This is uh, for people who do not want a computation. There's also this instrument that they can use to find Qibla. Uh, essentially what we have here is a map of the world and there is a ruler. The ruler can turn around the axis. So what you do is you just put the ruler on your locality and then you can read off the Qibla. We will show that. This is uh, mathematically very sophisticated because these lines that you see here, they are ellipses. So sometimes people, one uh, lady from the Netherlands has published a paper in which she said that this was perhaps too difficult for Muslims to find. So it was probably imported from Europe. It's of course nonsense, uh, I do not agree. So therefore I have an article which was published in Qatar and which you have seen where I showed that this was possible to find this in Islamic tradition. So here is uh, how to use it. You have in this world map, you have places, for example, Constantinia, which is Istanbul, which is here in the grid. Incidentally, here there are abjad numbers, the longitude and abjad here, which you can read. And then what you do is you put the ruler just on top of this uh, circle in the correct way. You have to do it in such a way that uh, side of the ruler which passes through the uh, center, it's this side, also passes through this dot. And then you can read of the Qibla at the other side of the uh, instrument. So this is a very spectacular uh, thing. Now you know that uh, Professor Fuad Sesgin rebuilt uh, many instruments in his museum in uh, Istanbul. But, and the museum was uh, 
also found it in several other localities. I was told that also in Sharia you have part of maybe part or all of the museum in Istanbul. But he never had the time to reconstruct this instrument, and maybe also because it's so difficult, and it is rather uh, a rather recent discovery. No one, thirty years ago, no one knew that this has ever been had ever been developed in the Islamic tradition. But fortunately, I now have a colleague in the Netherlands who is working on uh, redeveloping this instrument. So here he uh, here he has sent me what he has done very recently. So what you see is Mecca in the middle here. There's also a ruler, of course, which is not shown, but you have the world map, which is the same as, uh, as uh, is used in the instrument, but with some modern localities, for example, Sofia, Istanbul is there, but Sofia is there, and Budapest is there, Rome is there. They were not in the old instrument. Uh, Kabul was at that time not important. Karachi also is not on the instrument. There are some uh, places which are on the instrument, but in any case, this is more like a modern map, but uh, exactly according to the old principles. As Tamandra said, and uh, this is very nice, Fez is on there, Tunis is on there, Algiers is also on there, or even Agadir, which is near the end, because that was near the end of the Islamic world at that time. So this will be ready soon. And if you want to have it, you can just go to his, uh, his website, and leave your address and he will inform you when it's finished. So I'm very glad that this is now being uh, redone and re re uh, reconstructed in brass, also in metal. Here again are the, uh, the names. Of course, he had to abbreviate the names Erz. So Erz means Erzurum and Ankara means, uh, Anka means Ankara and so on. Tehran, Mashhad, Isfahan, Kerman, PA, Dubai, so we should be somewhere here. Sharjah is not on there, but Riyadh is, Bahrain is there, Medina, so many places. So, um, yeah, what is the uh, conclusion of all this talk? Why are we doing this? I think uh, this was all uh, very high level mathematics. And you can see that in 14th century Damascus, there were people who were mastering this, who knew this. And I think uh, this transition tradition can be very inspiring to modern high school students who learn essentially the same trigonometry because the mathematics is still valid. And I think, especially for Muslim students, it will be very good to see this high quality work because it makes them realize that this tradition is part of their own heritage. It is not something that was imported from the West. Well, maybe it was imported from the West, but before that the West imported from, is from Islamic civilization. So it's really, they are using something from Islamic civilization. So that is one reason, but I think there is another reason which may be even more important. And you re re really realize that when you look at these manuscripts. So this is the reason why I really want you to look at these manuscripts, because then you really look at what these people were writing. The manuscripts that you have seen were not written by Khalili, but by someone who lived maybe uh, 40 or 50 years later. And I think it's just unbelievable to be able to write a manuscript like this yourself. Once uh, in 1960, uh, no, 1986, I was working uh, as an assistant of David King, whom you have mentioned, whom uh, has been mentioned. And he had arranged for me to go to Istanbul to work in Suleimania library on the manuscript. And at that time, there was no one who could uh, give me a microfilm of that manuscript. So the only thing I could do was copy out the manuscript in hand by my own hand. So I was there for 14 days copying an Arabic manuscript by my own handwriting. And I think this is a very good exercise because it re makes you realize how difficult this all is. And it also makes you realize that these people who wrote these manuscripts and who did this Mathematics had an incredible willpower and concentration. But they had to compute everything by hand and copy everything by hand. They didn't have a computer, they didn't have a smartphone, they didn't have many of the uh, uh, possibilities that we have today. And because of these possibilities that we have, maybe we have lost some of their willpower and concentration. But if we look at their work, 
uh, what they have done, we realize that it is possible for us also to have the same willpower and concentration. And then that willpower and that concentration that they have together with uh, the modern technology will be something that will really prepare us for a harmonious future, I think. So thank you very much for this uh, presentation. You can download everything. So the handouts with and without the solutions at this address, GWS 2023, that means Graduate Winter School 2023, HTML. And I think it will be a rewarding project to publish the facsimile of the Paris manuscript with all the tables by Khalili, meaning the prayer tables, the Kibla tables and much else and in color, because that's even more beautiful than the Berlin manuscript. And if, for example, a foundation such as uh, Sifhams could publish that facsimile, perhaps with transcriptions of some of the tables, then that can be shown to high school students so they can see with their own eyes what has been done by the old Muwakkets and Muazins, and they can be inspired by them. So it has been a pleasure uh, for me to communicate uh, with you today thanks to modern technology. If you have any questions now, I am available for you. And if not, then you can always uh, send me an email. You can find my email address on the website to www.andthenmyname.nl. Thank you very much, Professor. Thank you very much, Professor Jan. Now, You're very welcome. Uh, we will open the floor for students and participants here, if they have any question, and those those who are online, you can pose your questions by writing. Uh, we open the floor for comments. Criticisms, you can also do. <laughs> Thank you, sir, for your wonderful presentation. My one of my question is that uh, you have already mentioned that uh, the aspects of scientific tradition uh, as uh, uh, finding Kibla prayer time, finding prayer time, and preparing Islamic calendar, and uh, uh, and uh, one more thing you have mentioned is that uh, geometric decorations. Yes, Why sir. that geometric decoration came though? Uh, is it is I, it part of uh, any religious thing or any other thing? Uh, some people say that it is, uh, you see, look, I am not an expert in Islamic law, but some people say that uh, there is uh, an uh, Islamic rule which says that you should not uh, make pictures of uh, created uh, things of humans and animals and so on, at least not on religious buildings. So therefore, if you want to have decoration of religious buildings, then two things are left, namely calligraphy and geometric uh, decoration. So this is why uh, I would uh, like to uh, join uh, geometric decorations to Islamic civilization, because another reason is that Islamic civilization really specialized in this. If you compare it, for example, with ancient Greek civilization, uh, people did not have anything like it. Then uh, in countries like uh, Pakistan and India, you only have geometric decorations uh, in relationship to uh, Islamic architecture. So this is why I think in any case, it is related to Islamic culture, but probably uh, also to Islamic religion. I know there are some exceptions, for example, in Iran in 17th century Safavi uh, architecture in Isfahan, there are also some, uh, some uh, pictures of uh, human beings and animals. And maybe there are even more pictures of, uh, of plants. Does that answer your question? Ah, oh, okay. Thank you, sir. Any question or comment, or as Professor Jan said, criticism? <laughs> Why not? I mean, criticism is the beginning of science. <laughs> Yes, Aisha, please. Thank you so much for this uh, engaging interactive session. My question is, if you have an idea, how do such manuscripts, especially the ones dealing with numbers, get translated into Latin? What is the mechanism to 
transform it into another language? Uh, you mean, is, is your question historical? Uh, do you mean how the translators in the 11th or 12th century uh, translated yes. it? Yes, if you have an idea, yes. Uh, how they did this? Well, um, is, is there something like a dictionary to oh, yeah, I see. Or, yes. Yeah, I think um, uh, the, the most important area for uh, this translation and transmission was uh, El Andalus, which means uh, what is now Spain. And um, of course, there was always uh, a boundary between areas that were uh, ruled by Muslims and areas that were ruled by Christians. But on the whole, uh, Christians would travel to uh, the Islamic areas and Muslims would travel to the Christian areas for, for many reasons. So um, what we know is that uh, in the 11th century, there were the Muslims there were, of course, extremely uh, competent in mathematics and astronomy. And some of the Christians who came there could be, uh, could be taught by them. Also, uh, it's very funny. I mean, the thing starts in this, the 10th century when some monks in Christian monasteries in uh, the sou southern part of France, they learned about the astrolabe. And so what happened is they, they got manuscripts from uh, uh, Al Andalus and they then start, started to draw, to make drawings of these manuscripts and to try to figure out what they meant and making some mistakes uh, in this. For example, there are some mistakes in the abjad numbers, which show that uh, the Christians didn't really understand it completely. But in this way, some sort of interaction started. And uh, we know that at least uh, for two or three centuries, it was uh, very possible for Christians to travel to uh, the Islamic uh, areas and also vice versa. And so the, uh, the most important 12th century translators were working in the middle of Spain in the city of Toledo which was Muslim until uh, a few decades earlier. So there were some people around who still knew the, uh, the Arabic and the Islamic science. And then in the 13th century, there was a king, a Christian king who wanted to know about Islamic science and who invited uh, Muslims and also Jews at his court to work together. And so in these groups, uh, what they created was an old Spanish uh, translation of some very technical uh, Islamic text. So in this way, through cooperation between cultures, essentially over a few centuries, the knowledge was transmitted. Now, the, maybe you have ever, have you ever heard about the name Fibonacci? There is something called Fibonacci numbers. Fibonacci. Does anybody know about that? They are saying yes, a yeah. few people well, are saying yes. Fibonacci is very interesting. This is a, an Italian guy whose uh, father had, uh, uh, was a, a merchant and he had, uh, a business in uh, Bejaya, which is a bougie in Al Algeria. So he sent his son to Bejaya. And there the son learned all about the Arabic uh, mathematics. And I think he also learned the Fibonacci numbers there. So the numbers that are uh, called after him, probably something he just learned in Algeria. And then uh, then he published uh, a work in, uh, in Italian about how wonderful the uh, Hindu Arabic numbers uh, were, which he had learned in uh, Algeria. So like this, transmission between people, living people who are communicating with each other. Otherwise, if you have no living people, nothing happens or just rubbish, usually. Is that enough uh, answer? She says yes, Prof. Okay. Professor, if you remember uh, during Sif Ham's uh, advisory board meeting uh, on last Thursday, I uh, I mentioned that you know that we have a very enthusiastic uh, PhD candidate in the University of Sharjah. Mm -hmm. Her background is uh, engineering, but uh, she's doing PhD in Sharia. Very good. And uh, we collaborated. Uh, we had a meeting, not collaboration. We had a meeting with uh, Sharjah Innovation and Technology, uh, Sharjah Innovation and Technology Center, something like that. Anyway, you know, uh, there is a, a center here. Uh, they, they deal, they, the section of the center deals with 3D uh, uh, production. So we did the Astrolabe, you know, with the help of uh, our uh, PhD candidate. Her name is Najla. 
-hmm. and I informed her about uh, your workshops that we have been doing to the high school students. Yeah. So probably we might be uh, converting the similar thing to our high school students here and give them workshops. She wants to ask a question. Okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Jan. My question is, um, can you give us a workshop on using uh, Astrolab? No, uh, this is the first yeah, this, we will be very pleased to do that, but it is yes. necessary for uh, my team to come and visit you, but we could certainly do that because we, I think one of the, uh, we have a long experience with uh, such workshops and the only way to uh, do that in a feasible way is to have uh, a model for each participant and that cannot be done by 3D printing because it's too expensive. So we have developed a way to do it with, uh, very cheap uh, models, and also with uh, different uh, uh, kinds of astrolabes and also different levels. So, but I think uh, probably I can also speak on behalf of my team members that we will be very pleased to uh, come and to not only to teach uh, our workshops to you, but also to train you. So uh, we don't have to come again and you can continue with uh, our workshops and also teach them yourselves and then also uh, change them because every audience is different. So for every audience, you want to have it in a slightly different form. So the answer is yes, why not? If you want, um, I have on my website a section which is called uh, presentations and workshops. You can go there and you will find some material on the workshops that we did, including a small video that was uh, uh, taken in uh, Northern Cyprus. We went exactly a year ago, we were in the uh, Republic of Northern Cyprus and we were doing their programs at five different high schools during a week, uh, together with an exhibition on um, history of Islamic science, because also an important thing is to, to join it to something else. I mean, not just have a workshop because that sort of evaporate, evaporates, but you want to have a workshop and also another project in order to uh, give them some more uh, more knowledge about the tradition. And the other project could be a visit to a museum, such as the museum that you have in Sharjah, where they can see with their own eyes some replicas of the old instruments. Yes, thank you very much. We will be in touch uh, with you to organize that. Thank and with much. the help of the workshop you gave us today, uh, we can use the table uh, to do uh, to print the numbers in the abjad, uh, the abjad towers or alphanumeric numbers, because of the design we have now, it's with English. Now, okay. with the aid of this workshop, we are able to put the numbers okay. uh, and uh, actually and do, to um, measure the uh, the degrees, whether it will be divided by six or five. So, with the aid of this workshop, this will be uh, done, inshallah. Very nice. Thank you very much. Thank if, you. If you need any other materials, if you need tech files uh, or whatever or photos, uh, we. Uh, we would be very glad to put everything at your disposal. Thank you, Professor Jan. Do we have any question from online? I, I think Professor answered that, how can we make the young generation more enthusiastic about this system? And is it easy to teach? Your experience, uh, I guess. Your, is this a question to me? Yes. Uh, from online uh, participants? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, um, uh, I mean, I don't know. I mean, we have uh, basically for me, everything started when uh, I first learned about these instruments. I was interested in Islamic scientific tradition and I understood nothing about these instruments. So I was reading the books, but I didn't understand it. And uh, then I noticed that in museums, what they were saying about it also was not uh, comprehensible to me. So I only started to understand these instruments after I had rebuilt them myself. So that is the way in which I entered this uh, tradition. And then um, yeah, I, have, I have found out that uh, in the Netherlands, uh, mathematics really has a sort of a problem because there are many people who do not like it. And uh, we wanted to make it sort of uh, accessible to a wider audience. And this is why we started and continued to develop these uh, workshops. And I think um, we have had very good experiences, but um, 
uh, whether or not it really uh, depends or it really becomes success depends on getting uh, mathematics teachers and in general teachers in high schools enthusiastic. So I think what we were trying to do now is really uh, give these workshops to uh, high school teachers and ask them to uh, to teach them to their students. And the problem is that uh, the mathematics program that we have in the Netherlands is very much overloaded. And the uh, high school students have to uh, learn a lot of mathematics in very little time. So usually there is no time for these workshops. So in that sense, uh, our experiences have been uh, a bit mixed. But then in uh, Lefkosia in uh, Northern Cyprus, we had a very good experience. We were there for a week. The, the El Kaf uh, Islamic Foundation had invited us. And when we were back, uh, they immediately invited us again. Can you come again? for another week. So after, of, of course, after three weeks, we could not do it because my two me temp team members are working at university or in high school, so they cannot just leave at any time. But that was very successful. So I think um, essentially uh, the biggest potential of these workshops is in areas where uh, civilization is Islamic. And um, I don't know if uh, Islam is always the best way to enter uh, the subject. I mean, that depends on the audience. There are also uh, high school students who are more uh, accessible to these uh, workshops when one enters uh, from the point of view of science. That means that the exercises that you have to have in these workshops have to be very difficult, so they are motivated to solve them. Then you can tease them by saying that if you can't solve it, your ancestors could solve it. So uh, try to be as good as your ancestors. I mean, this way you have to teach them a little tease them a little bit all the time. So that is about my experience. Thank you, Professor Jan. Uh, I think we conclude here. Uh, Professor Alpassan has a question. Please uh, hold on. Uh, I think you said at one point that the abject uh, numerals were taken from the Greek uh, alphabet. Yeah. Is there a table showing that completely? So where uh, can we find it? Uh, you can uh, find it in, um, uh, for example, in the uh, edition of the Conex of Apollonius, uh, published by Gerald Toomer. So the name is Toomer, T-O-O-M-E-R. And uh, it is called a translate, something like the translation of the Conex of Apollonius uh, by Banu Musa. If you can't find it, you can send me an email. He has a table which has uh, a relationship between Greek and Arabic, because of course, what he was editing was an Arabic translation of a Greek text. So of course, uh, the translator later changed the abjad in the Greek into the abjad in the Arabic. So he has a table in there. But it's also interesting that if you look at high numbers from 100 and higher, it is not uh, really, uh, uh, similar anymore because then they start to, they start to have differences. But until 100, it is sort of similar. If you can't find the book, send me an email because I can also send you a photocopy of the table. Uh, and thank you very much. This uh, one question came to my mind because uh, uh, when uh, I was talking about the history of mathematics in Islamic civilization, uh, before, uh, as you know, decimal system was invented by Al Khawarizmi. But before that was invented, I was wondering how did they did calculation? It would be very difficult. Did yeah, they well, use the Did they use the letters again? They, they used they used the system base sixty. So the sexagesimal system with hours, minutes, and seconds that was already it was invented in Iraq, but uh, more than two thousand years before Khawarizmi by the old Babylonians. So they were very familiar with that. So the astronomers uh, always uh, computed in this system base 60 with uh, degrees, minutes, and seconds. And in a circle, the maximum number of degrees is 360. So therefore, you never have high numbers. So they were very familiar with uh, uh, computing in the sexagesimal system. So and that you can see that because we still do in these... Uh, hours, minutes, seconds. Why do we still use hours, minutes, seconds? Because it's very difficult to change that. To change the sexagesimal system into the decimal system is very difficult. And for hours, minutes, seconds, it has not been done and it will probably never be done. 
thank you very much, Professor Yan. We will keep you some two more minutes, you know, uh, on the screen like this. Any, if you are into, if you want to take a picture, you can come here. Uh, uh, you can come, and Professor Yan is on the screen, you know, here. We can take a, a, a picture with Professor Yan. <laughs> Well, I will I will show a replica of an astrolabe which I received uh, recently. And uh, thank you, Professor Jan, for this wonderful lecture. <laughs> okay. Yes, well, mashallah. It is an astrolabe which has abject uh, also. Yes. It was made in Germany by. Uh... Fantastic. We have been proposing this to have in uh, in uh, roundabouts uh, uh, squares of Sharjah to have in each main roundabout uh, this kind of astrolabe. You know, hopefully in the, in the future. I, I think you should also have this uh, this instrument for finding tibla. I mean, this is. Uh, this is why I'm so glad that my colleague is now uh, making that. But that is also a very easy uh, uh, thing to show the high level of uh, Islamic uh, scientific tradition. But the Thank you, Professor. Ladies, do you want to take a picture? Come, we can come quickly, but you know, we, will, we don't want to keep anyone. <laughs> come quickly, you know, so we, we are centered you know, here. So I have, you can see the abjad on the screen, right? Yes, faster, faster, please. Ah. <laughs> no, no, give, give, I shall take and we'll, you know, I shall take. Okay. Uh, while they are getting ready, Prof, uh, thank you very much, Professor Jan, for your uh, contribution and uh, for this wonderful lecture. We will be, uh, uh, tomorrow is our last day. Uh, we will start with Professor Andreas's lecture and then we will continue with Professor Hamid and Naimi's lecture and then we will conclude our International Graduate Winter School. Uh, please, please come, come. Take this, you know. I, uh, Aisha is going to take pictures. Get, come, prof, Professor Opasan. Kili, Kili. But because I, we want this astrolabe to be here, isn't it? If you can uh, uh, put it up a little bit, astrolabe prof. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Professor Andreas, you can join. <laughs> Thank you, Aisha. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. Have a nice evening, and we will be in touch. See you tomorrow. Bye bye. Greetings to your family. Okay. Thank you.